Uh, thank you. That, that's, uh, <laughs> that introduction was very nice. I appreciate the comments. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to go someplace else with that. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm utterly just uh, humbled and, and, and quite excited to be here. Uh, when, when I was asked to uh, participate in this, um, uh, I, was, I, was, I was quite humbled, and, and I said, wow, this, uh, this brings me back to Richmond. I've been here a couple of times. I enjoy coming to Richmond. Uh, Richmond is, is a place where when you come, you, you sort of uh, you get hit head on with, with the history of race in America. And, and VCU in particular uh, uh, playing a, a particular role for, for, for this community. So uh, I'm excited to be here, quite, um, uh, <laughs> I, I brought my sneakers just in case I need to get out of here quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously though, um, what I'm going to talk about today could be a bit um, uncomfortable for, for some of you. And, and that's how we grow. We talk about issues that are a little uncomfortable. Uh, especially the ones that are pertinent and, and important for uh, moving forward, okay? And what better way to do it than look at uh, the, the biology, the genetics, right? So I study genetics. I want to understand what is it that makes us who we are. Uh, how do we pass this information on? And how does that information impact risk for disease? It's very important for me because growing up, I was the only black kid in many of my classes. And so I would look around and I'd see people who didn't look like me or my parents or my family. And I wondered what was so different about them. And I said, oh, it must be family history and genetics. And so that's what really got me involved in genetics. All right? So, so let's, let's get into this journey. I, my talk is going to be a series of stories, OK? I think that's the best way to describe my, my trajectory or my, um, my experience, is by providing some, some narratives about about my work. And so it, it, in the end, you guys will say, oh, he talked about a lot of different things. Hopefully, you'll go home with something, <laughs> some little tidbit. So the scientists in the room, the geneticists in the room, when they see this, they say, oh, this is, this is the chromosome. There's 23 chromosomes, 23, tw 23 pairs of chromosomes that we all have in every single cell of our body. Every cell except for the red blood cell contains these chromosomes. And we get one pair of each one of those from our mother and the other pair from our father. And so we sort of have a mixture of our parents. And that's why sometimes your mother would say, you know, you look like your daddy or you act like your daddy. And I would say, yeah, I hope I act like my daddy. I should. I should resemble him and act like him at some level. Let's get this straight, mom. <laughs> but what is it on those chromosomes that cause this resemblance and the transmission of certain traits like skin color and, and hair color and eye color, body height, body weight, but then also susceptibility to diseases like, like prostate cancer, one of which I study, or, or breast cancer, or, or type 2 diabetes, end stage renal disease, um, nappy hair, you know, oh, it's not a disease, I'm sorry. No two people, I don't care if they're identical twins or not, have the same identical genetic makeup. It's an interesting process how this mixture occurs uh, uh, as the uh, sperm fertilizes the egg. And that mixture creates what we call genetic diversity. We look at all of those chemical bases that are called nucleotides. There's four of them. We call them ATC and G for short. And the profile or the sequence of those nucleotides code for things that are important for these traits, like, like I said, skin color, hair color, and eye texture. And you'll notice that some of these are colored. The yellow color is an area in the genome where there's a change. And some people may have one of those nucleotides. Others may have the other form of a nucleotide. We call those, those polymorphisms. Poly means many. Morph means forms, many different forms. Of that, of that sequence. And so it, 
in this room, 94% of you may have a C at the uh, second to last position. And then 6% may have a T. So it's, a, it's what we call a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism. So I'm going to talk some about SNPs today. I just wanted to give you some background on this because some of these SNPs are very important. Most of them aren't, though. Most of them have no major consequence. Some of them have uh, uh, major consequences, like, for instance, leading to diseases like uh, sickle cell disease. How many people know somebody with sickle cell in their family or their friends? Or their, and, you know, most of the people raise their hand are people of color. It's a, it's a very um, uh, debilitating disease. It's, it's, it's common among people in West Africa, but also the Mediterranean, too, and mainly in areas where the diseases like malaria are end endemic. And those populations have a mutation or a polymorphism in a gene called beta globin that uh, causes the disruption in that protein. And so the ultimate um, consequence is instead of having a circular red blood cell, those cells that move throughout your body and provide oxygen to the lungs, right? Instead of having it circular so it can flow through your blood vessels correctly, it's sickle shaped. And what happens is, as it's flowing through, it gets into some capillaries, and it gets stuck. And you can have a crisis. And in some cases, you can die, all from just one polymorphism. So there's some serious consequences with that. Other diseases like cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs are due to single nucleotide polymorphism. When we look at these variants across, these polymorphisms across the world, one of the things we find is that African populations have a lot more genetic variation than non-African populations. I'll say that again. African populations have a lot more genetic variation than non-African populations. This is uh, data from Sarah Tishkoff's group where they looked at one of the genes, CD4 gene, involved in the immune response. Uh, this is not atypical. This is typical of what we see throughout the genome where African populations have a lot more variation than European and Asian populations. In fact, for these, um, uh, these, these uh, uh, clusters of, of, of polymorphisms, you find that in, in this study, they showed about close to 200 in Africa, about 98, and about 73 in Asia. But the take home point here, though, is, is that there's a lot of variation that's shared. If you look at that Venn diagram, that's shared across all those populations. But there's also a lot that's exclusive to Africa. And why is that? Because African populations are oldest in the world, some of the oldest, right? African populations gave rise to all the, uh, the rest of, of humanity. Um, African populations have been a lot larger in size than the rest of the world. And so that's why there's a lot more variation there. And in fact, 50% of that variation is exclusive just to Africa while only 10% or so is exclusive to Europe and Asia. This is the pattern that we see throughout the genome, for the most part. This is important to understand, because if you're somebody like me who's a geneticist, you go where the action is, right? If I was a, 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 a mason or a jeweler, if I was a mason, I'd deal with bricks and mortar, right? If I was a jeweler, I'd deal with diamonds and gold or platinum. I know y'all like platinum, right? No? <laughs> Silver? OK, gold, OK. I'm a geneticist, right? So I, I want to know where the action is with the genes. And the action is in Africa. Because of the history of human population. And it's not something that's outrageous or whatever. I mean, the, the historians and the archaeologists and the, and the geneticists, anthropologists, have all said the same thing. Humanity started in Africa. And this is evidence for that. Now, if you're studying diseases, right, genetic disease, and you understand that in order to really uncover genetic risk factors, you need to look at variation. You should look at African populations. Because they're not, they have a lot of variation there. That could allow you to really uncover the genetics of the disease. But also, these polymorphisms are in genes that are important for drug response, or drug, what we call drug efficacy. Some of you guys might be taking a particular drug. Let's say you have asthma, or you have um, um, allergies. Some of you guys might respond better to Zyrtec than Claritin D, right? Each in the same family, brothers and sisters. One can take Claritin D and respond, the other one can't. That's because of these different polymorphisms that impact the efficacy or the response of that drug. So if you are trying to understand which genes are important, 
where would you go to study those genes? You'd go to Africa. But historically, for very long, uh, you know, you look at the history of biomedical research, Africa was not in, in that history. We studied European populations. We studied white men in particular. We did. All the data, pretty much, is reflective of white males. And then all of a sudden, they said, oh, we should study women, too. They forgot about the, you know, they said, okay, we'll start studying women. But now, in the last five, ten years, we're getting a lot more data out of Africa, a lot more genetic information. And it's been quite interesting because it's almost turning things upside down in terms of our understanding for genetics and risk for disease. Because there's a lot of variation in the African population. This is, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> Giving you an example of uh, how some of these polymorphisms, these genetic variants, the effects of them are different across populations. A good example is Alzheimer's, this uh, E4, APOE4 gene. It's a, it's a variant, it's a polymorphism in the APOE gene. And if we look at risk for Alzheimer's, we, we, studies have shown consistently that this, is a, uh, this polymorphism or this form of this gene increases risk for Alzheimer's, but the, the risk is not the same across all populations. Among Japanese or Asian populations, it's almost six-fold increased risk for individuals with that variant versus those who don't have it. If we look at uh, white populations, it's about three-fold higher. But it's only 1.1-fold, slightly elevated risk for black. And folks are like trying to understand what's going on there. And then when we look at the frequency of that polymorphism, we find that it's much more common in the African descent population. And it's, and it's less frequent in Asian population. And so we said, oh, you know what? Maybe there's other genes that are involved. So it's a gene-gene interaction that's impacting risk. Or maybe it's the environment that's impacting the elevated risk in white and Asian populations. But the only way we knew that is by looking at more populations. So that's one of my themes today, is, is, is looking at diverse populations in order to fully understand the, these, these uh, health-related questions. Because, as I said, for so long, we studied just, what? White men. <laughs> Another example, even in the African diaspora, something that's very fascinating. This came from uh, Richard Cooper and Charles Rotimi's data back in 97, where they looked at the prevalence of hypertension by body mass index. So they looked at uh, populations in West Africa, Caribbean, and North America, these are African descent populations, and they looked at the prevalence of, of, of hypertension, and it's, oh my God, the slide isn't there. I mean, the, the figure is, is there, but it's, you can't see it. <laughs> is, there, is there a, here it is, okay. What, what you would see here is that, um, <laughs> <laughs> what you should see, what you should see here is that um, we would have BMI on this side, and uh, no, we'd have on the x-axis BMI, and on the y-axis we'd have um, percentage of hypertension. And what we find is that as populations leave West Africa, they're getting bigger. And also, with that increase in BMI is this increase in the prevalence of hypertension, right? These are all the same similar populations in terms of genetics, similar genetic background. We have Nigeria and West Africa in this study. There's um, uh, Jamaica and, and uh, I think Barbados was the Caribbean population, and then Chicago, African Americans in Chicago. And what, what, what it reflects is that with the increase in body mass index, so increases uh, the prevalence of hypertension. So we have a comparative study which looks at the uh, population genetics, and it allows us to say genetics probably isn't driving this increase. What's probably driving this increase is the environment. So what are the environmental differences that they saw? Well, they found that in, the, in West Africa, they were eating more of a, a traditional diet. It wasn't westernized, so there wasn't a lot of fat. There wasn't a lot of, uh, of salt in the diet. They also found that folks were being a lot more active. Uh, they weren't sedentary like we are now. We, we, we drive Cadillac Escalades to work and stop at Wendy drive throughs and, and take the elevator up one flight. 
in West Africa, they ride bikes and walk. Okay? And so the genetics is the story here. The story is the environment. And you find that out by looking at across multiple populations. This is data from the vitamin D data that we have uh, from black men in Chicago. And one of the things we found is that with increasing vitamin D intake, it actually increases the effect of a particular polymorphism on serum vitamin D levels. So, of course, the more vitamin D you take, there is this additive effect uh, from these different polymorphisms. For those of you who don't know, these are African Americans. <laughs> Just a review of black folk. This is important because this is, uh, this is going to be the take home point. You'll notice there that Halle Berry is in there several times. She, I have a crush on her. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I have to admit that up front. Um, these are all black folk. Anybody know who she is up top there? Huh? Oh, she was on The Apprentice. Who said that? Yeah, so you must be a bit older. A lot of the younger folks don't know this. this she was on the first season of The Apprentice. Her name was, uh, I think, Stacy, I think it was. And uh, she, she, <laughs> she was the first person fired that, uh, what's his name, fired? <laughs> Ever. First person fired. And uh, they, they thought she was crazy, actually. They said that she was crazy. And so they f he fired her, first episode, first season. And uh, I remember I was at OSU at the time, and I went to work the next day, and some of my colleagues said, isn't that messed up how they, they just fired the black woman? And I just looked at him. I said, look, man, this is a reality show, man. This is reality. <laughs> this is reality. What are you talking about? No surprise here. All right, so these are black folk. That's my daughter with a red hat. And then Barack Obama. These are all African Americans, right? Do you remember when Barack was running? And blacks in, in, in the south side of Chicago actually were upset. They was like, he's not black enough. You remember that when he first ran the first time? Folks were like, you know, he, he wasn't an authentic African American because his mom is from uh, Europe and his daddy's East African, Kenyan. And so he doesn't have or share that black experience like descendants of enslaved Africans here in the US. And that's real. That's, that was a real criticism. And if we look at his genetics, it doesn't resemble much of that that we see from those others on that, on that, on that page. And it's funny, because Halle Berry has more African ancestry, West African ancestry, than Barack does. Uh, Halle remembers her mother is white, and her father, he may not be 100% Mandingo, so I think she probably has more than 50% European ancestry. But what? She wins the Academy Award, she gets up there, she's crying, and she says, this is for black women everywhere. And nobody in this room will say she's not black. But at least 50% of her genes come from Europe. Do you guys see what I'm saying? So this, goes, this sort of throws this whole issue of race upside down. This is why I like studying ancestry, because it allows us to um, not only reconcile this issue of race, but deconstruct race, so that we can apply what's important in our studies. Because for so long, we use race as a proxy. Right? And in the US, race has been largely used uh, be, uh, based on skin color, which is why we're always trying to reconcile. You guys didn't realize that wasn't um, Denzel. That was Vijay Singh, the golfer. His problem is that he gets darker after every tournament. <laughs> and so if he doesn't have that green coat on, he's got some issues. Cavs, Cavs won't stop for him. He knows it. He won't admit it. He won't admit it. You know, he goes into a bank, he's like, you know, I'm, you know, no, nah, you the Negro. He, he could be walking down the street here, and, and most people will say he's an African American. You know, if, you know, if somebody gets robbed or whatever, they'll you point right to him and say it's a black guy. <laughs> Think about what I'm saying here. Skin color and, and, and ancestry in the United States have been used to, um, uh, in particular, to characterize uh, uh, race. So what, is it, what are some of the genetic features of African Americans? And this is important because when I, was, when I first started doing this, I was at Howard University. I just got my PhD. I was uh, part of a team at Howard where we were uh, part of this uh, human genome center, the first genome center at a historically black college. And all we studied was health disparities. And it wasn't, we didn't call it health disparities. We, we, we called it studying black people, OK? <laughs> That was before the disparities, you know, started, this whole buzzword for disparities. So one of the things we found was that there was 
and I used to say this all the time back then, African Americans are not homogeneous or monolithic. We weren't monolithic in our thinking, socially, culturally, and damn sure genetically or biologically. I mean, we would, you could just go home, right, or, or go to family reunions and you'll see that diversity in the, in, your fam in the black family, right? And so why would we think that we can just be grouped together as one race? So what is it about the African American population? High genetic diversity. I told you why earlier when I showed you that Venn diagram, there's a lot more genetic variation in Africa. So that's part of our gene pool, the diverse and African ancestry, the antiquity of the African gene pool. And then gene flow or admixture is what we call it, genetic, geneticists call it admixture. That's gene flow from non-African populations. That's mainly driven by white males historically in the United States. But then some of you say you have Native American ancestry. So I, all right, okay. <laughs> Mignon, yes you do have some. Are you, okay? <laughs> I, I believe you. We claim Native American ancestry before we claim anything. I mean, it's, it's funny. I've been running around. I'll show you some data in a second. It, it's amazing. But one of the things that's fascinating when you look at the African American experience, though, is the pattern of genetic variation. It, it varies geographically where you are in the US. And each one of those areas has its own sort of local history and, and, and social experiences, which impact that genetic diversity. So. 95% of the African American gene pool comes from Western Central Africa, from Northern Senegal to Southern Angola. Enormous biological diversity there. There's, there's several ecological zones there. There's tropical rainforest. There's um, grassland, Sahel. All of that is in that area. And then 5% comes from East Africa, which is Mozambique and Madagascar. So not only is there a lot of biological diversity, there's a lot of of cultural diversity, thousands of different languages and, and, and traditions and religions in that area. These individuals were enslaved and brought to the New World, tens of, of millions of them, and so, and mixed up in terms of, of the, their descendants, mixed in the sense of um, not, main, being, not um, consistent with, with the uh, tradition and history of, of those communities, and many, many of them lost that information. What I find fascinating is that South America is very, um, was, 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 the, um, um, uh, uh, was the location where many enslaved Africans were brought. So we have uh, um, Brazil where there's 90, not 90, 80 million black folk in Brazil today, people of dis African descent, 80 million. And you guys think Richmond is black. <laughs> or I used to think South Side of Chicago was black, 80 million. Colombia and even Northern Peru is what they call this black belt where many of the enslaved Africans were brought. And the histories uh, and the traditions of those communities today, they, they reflect some of that African um, uh, history. What's even more fascinating is that only about 500,000 enslaved Africans were brought to North America, only about 500,000. So from 500,000, we now have what, 35 or so million, 36 million African Americans? It's an enormous growth since uh, the beginning of slavery. So where were they brought? They were brought to three main colonies, right? The British controlled east, so there's Virginia there, and so that was British. Florida was Spanish territory, and then the French, the Louisiana territory. Now those are different European cultures and communities and, and countries. And their behavior towards black folk were different. Some of them were very hostile and mean and angry and standoffish. Others were, you know, <laughs> they, they promoted mixing. Uh, you know, the, the French, the French thought they were lovers. Remember French? French is a love language, isn't it? The language of love? I thought so, that's why I took it in high school. I thought I was a lover. Vous et vous, you know, I love you. <laughs> so the French promoted mixing. And so they set up the, the many traditions and cultures around mixing, right? You, you guys read um, Anne Rice's, you remember she, she wrote those vampire books? She wrote one book, which was very good, um, Feast of All Saints. So it was sort of a history of, of uh, the antebellum uh, period in, in Louisiana. And uh, she was describing placage, 
I don't know if I said it right. But that's where, you know, as the young French men were coming of age, they would go to these big balls, these cotillions, and they'd be band playing, and they'd be lined against the wall, all these beautiful black women who were mixed and who they could, you know, pick and choose who they wanted to sow their seeds with before they, you know, went on and did what they did as a, as a so-called gentleman. <laughs> but uh, that history is one in which there was uh, negotiation. And um, a, a culture was centered around that. And children were born because of that, children of mixed ancestry. And that was in the French territory. While in the British territory, it was a little different. Rules that were evolved out of there were um, anti-miscegenation laws. Um, they actually thought that they could stop people from mixing. So I tell my students all the time, you know, genes stay, don't stay in your genes. <laughs> Uh, you guys are, come on. <laughs> Think about what I'm saying here. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Genes don't stay in your genes. Anytime you bring two groups of people together, there's going to be some mixing. And so here in, in South Carolina in particular, that's where a lot of the anti-miscegenation rules came out of, there was so much mixing going on, people was getting upset about it because these children of mixed ancestry were born. Um, uh, and and uh, it got to the point where the wives would petition the court to uh, set uh, rules and, 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 and guidelines on how white men should behave because of the, uh, the, their so-called lust for African uh, women, enslaved African women. So think about that. I mean, they, this was something that was ongoing. If you controlled that property, you did what you want to do with it. But if it had a child, that's interesting because then, if you go, if you if you if you adhere to the European guidelines at the time, that child should inherit your wealth. But there was one way out of that. What they said was, well, if the child is of mixed ancestry, he's black, he's a Negro, one drop. And so, once you classify an individual like that, they their their um, inheritance or the transmission of wealth and power. Is, is, is gone. That's, that was why the one drop rule or the rule of hypo descent was so important. And that's also why it came out of South Carolina because there was, at one point, an enormous amount of children of mixed ancestry being born. They didn't know how to handle that. They said, okay, well, they're going to be um, denoted or, or classified or characterized just as their mama is, which is black. And they didn't have any rights at that point. So you think about the rule of hypo descent. And you say, you know, why did they set that up? That was set up to maintain money and power, right? And it was established. People responded to it and adhered to it. And still today, we adhere to it. That's why I said if Halle Berry comes in right now and she sat right here, you wouldn't say she's not black, right? Right, I'd say she's a beautiful black woman. <laughs> But the rule of hypo descent by itself created so much diversity in the African American population because it was a classification scheme. So it's a situation where you have these groups that are in between that are now classified as one group with, 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 with the other group. Um, and, and, it, and it created an enormous amount of genetic variation. And we're still grappling with that today. Now, some of you are wondering, what's going on in Florida? Florida is interesting because the Spanish control Florida. And I, I, I describe this. Uh, situation is like absentee landlords. The Spanish weren't hanging out in Florida. They set up a system where they went back home and said, you just send, home, send the molasses, the sugar, and the money. You guys handle it. And for the most part, there was a lot of chaos in Florida. Many of you historians know what I'm talking about, where the, the uh, Seminole Nation uh, and many of the escaped enslaved Africans out of southern Georgia went into Florida and was whipping behind. It was a lot of chaos and a lot of fighting. A lot of it is because the Spanish were like, you know, hands off. It was almost like, you know how it is. You guys, don't, you guys have rented property from some landlords who just was like absent. <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. That's exactly what happened. All right, so we have Spanish, Europe, uh, Spanish, British, and French. All behave differently. All creating a culture in those areas, those communities, that impacted the biology and the genetics of those populations, okay? 
Um, if you look at Louisiana now, there's this class, a caste system, right? Um, uh, where there's different levels of African, uh, that, that of different levels of privilege among African Americans. And that was established back during the time of the Pocahontas. If we go back to what I was saying about uh, these young men um, engaging in relationships with these women at these, after these balls, after a while, the women and their grandparents, or I mean, well, grandparents, the women and their mother or their grandmother would get pretty savvy in negotiating. And they would say things like, if a child is born from this, this fling that you're about to have with my daughter or granddaughter, and if it's a male child, I want you to send them to France to be educated. And guess what? Many of them did that. And they would come back to Louisiana, and they would have, uh, um, I'm, I'm uh, losing it here. Uh, they would have a, a <laughs> uh, yeah, they would have an advantage, but they would have a, a skill. I'll just use that word, skill. <laughs> they would be craftsmen. They would be blacksmiths. They would be carpenters. You know, they had a skill. And they could read, many of them. And so that alone would set up this system where there was privileged people of color who were mixed, and then those who were not as privileged in terms of education and opportunity. And we see that still today, that those, those families and those class systems. I think it's fascinating. That's why I study black folk, OK? Now, this is where black folk are today. This is, this, even though it says 2,000 census, the last census is the same as this. The only thing that's different is that New Orleans is not as black as it was before Katrina. Now, uh, most of the black folk are here in Houston. That's why Houston going through all this mess. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the southern, what we call the crescent um, southern uh, southeastern states are where we find African Americans. You don't see them out in Wyoming and North Dakota <laughs> unless they're playing basketball or football. So you find them mainly in the crescent southern um, uh, southwest, uh, southeastern states. Now, this is interesting because this is the Mississippi River, densely black, still black today. <coughs> Chicago, uh, Detroit, um, uh, anybody know what this is right here? Everybody says that. It's not LA. It's Oakland. Everybody says LA. He's like, forget about Oakland. Oak Town. What I find interesting is this area here in um, central Pennsylvania. There's this little county here that's pretty black. It's called Mount Union. And Mount Union was one of the almost, it was like the second to last stop of the Underground Railroad. It was a stop, one of the stops of the Underground Railroad. And um, it was an established black town, all black town, um, historically. And, it's, and if you go there now, you, they have a lot of uh, information historically about this, the, uh, the town. But what's fascinating is that it's surrounded by a lot of white folk, right? So I actually went with a colleague into that area uh, and sampled and found that even in the white surrounding areas, that many of the whites there had significant African ancestry. Right? So it goes back to my issue of saying genes don't stay in your genes. Right? <laughs> and many of those white families didn't even realize that they had significant African ancestry. These are Hispanic. Now, people who study uh, demography and, and um, segregation, you, you're, you, you'll be like, wow, this is segregation at a macro level. These are blacks, these are Hispanics. One more time. These are blacks, <laughs> these are Hispanics. The dividing line being Texas. And Texas actually right now, historically the last 10 years, has been what South Carolina was during slavery. It's a hotbed for issues of race. And it's not just black and white issues. It's black, white, and Hispanic, right? Look at, look at the, uh, so we have southwestern Texas, uh, San Antonio, which is Hispanic, southeastern Texas, which is Houston, which is black, and then northern Texas, where Dallas is, is white. And so as a state, they have a lot of issues related to race, and it crosses economics, uh, health, um, religion, family, all of that. But what I find fascinating about this is that most of these Hispanics here in the southwest are what we call Mexican-Americans, right? And so they have high levels of Native American genetic ancestry. 
But the other Hispanics like we see on the East Coast, here in New York, D.C., and Florida, and then also Chicago, are Cuban, Dominican, and they have significant African ancestry. Puerto Rican. But NIH, or the government, the federal government, classifies them all as Hispanic. So here's a situation where if you have a grant from NIH, National Institutes of Health, and you're recruiting, let's say you're studying asthma and you're recruiting Hispanics, um, you're recruiting Mexican Americans, and let's say you're also do, uh, collecting some um, um, Puerto Ricans, you have to put them all together because they speak Spanish. But genetically, they're very different. And I'll show you data uh, and, and explain why in a second. But because they speak the same language and for some reason, the government is, is a bunch of, uh, 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 you're taping this, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is where it gets crazy. Remember Tiger Woods said he was Cablasian? Cablasian, and folks was like, boy, sit your butt down. <laughs> what he was saying was, is that he was appreciating and, and, and identifying with all of his ancestry. His mother's Asian, his father is mixed black and white, so he said he was Caucasian, Asian, and black. So he called himself a Cablasian. I called himself crazy. But if you look in the census, the f where folks identify it with as mixed race, because historically, and especially in the southeast, I mean, the so yeah, southeast, in the south southern states, black folk, I don't care how many white ancestors you have, you're going to say you're black, right? We adhere to the one drop rule pretty much. But out west, they don't. That's why when I used to go to California, I used to be like, these black folk are different. <laughs> First time I went to San Francisco, I was like, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> Think about what I'm saying here. You identify yourself based on how you socialize. And it's a different way of being social. It's a different social experience out west. So in particular, the Pacific Northwest is where a lot of the multicultural stuff emerged over the last 20 years. A lot of that stuff came out of the Pacific Northwest. It's just a different social experience. And so I call it the new blacks versus the old blacks in the South. Old blacks are those identified as black and white, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a black male, right? But out, out West, I could be anything, just like Tiger said, right? He's Cablasian. <laughs> the old and new blacks. The new blacks, though, have a different way of identifying themselves and a different social experience. I just, I, and I don't think e either one is right or wrong. I, I appreciate that, that uh, diversity in thought and, identi and identity, um, but, but it, it, you have to recognize that. You have to recognize that. Even Arizona, Mignon, I'm sorry to, to picking on you. Even Arizona is, is, uh, is on there as high levels of mixed ancestry who identify themselves as high levels. But what, what's the highest? It's in Oklahoma, this area here in Oklahoma. Now, some of you are saying, well, what the heck is going on in Oklahoma? You remember the Trail of Tears? The five civilized tribes where they were moved into um, reservations into Oklahoma, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole. Many of them, before they were moved out, had, had um, shared experiences with African, either enslaved Africans or African Americans. And there are black freedmen communities today. I've been to them. I've seen this. And, and so they, when they go through the census, they say they're mixed. But it's not just blacks that are saying this. Even the white folk are saying that they are mixed with Native American ancestors. Even the whites. That's why it's so many people there in the state. Now, why is that? Because you can, it's applicable. It's, you can actually utilize that information. It's important. You, people value being Native American now. Native Americans went from ashy to classy. <laughs> Think about what I'm saying. No, I'm dead serious. Overnight, in the early 90s, nobody wanted to be Native American. But then all of a sudden, the 90s came, the federal government said, we're going to give reparations to these five civilized tribes. And they, and they you know, Seminole Nation went from uh, poverty to Fortune 500. They bought property, casinos, and they're a Fortune 500 company, the Seminole Nation. Hard Rock Casino is owned by the Seminole Nation. So many benefits come from those who can identify and show this ancestry of Native American ancestry. You get um, health-related benefits, 
housing, education, all of that. So it's, it means something now. You can actually utilize that information. That's why we see both black, white, and Hispanics claiming mixed ancestry there. But this is where it gets crazy, because in the clinic, all of that <laughs> social stuff doesn't mean anything. <laughs> How you classify yourself doesn't mean anything, biologically, because we have to really look at that genetic ancestry. This, this, this is a, a, um, a two-dimensional plot showing the, um, the spread of ancestry in four different populations. Nigerians are in black, African Americans are in red, blue are whites, and green are French. Um, and we did this uh, stu study in, in Chicago, so they were blacks from Chicago and whites from Chicago. And you'll see that there is no clear dividing line. There is a lot of mixture there, it's fuzzy in the middle, okay? Now this is important because, as I mentioned earlier, when we think about complex disease, Historically, in the biomedical field, race was used as a crude proxy. A crude proxy for some shared biology, genetics, and a crude proxy for environment, diet, lifestyle. And so you look through the literature, you find that blacks, black African ancestry or black American, um, being black is a risk for a stroke, or being black is a risk for asthma, dying from asthma. Being black is a risk for dying of triple negative breast cancer. What does that mean, being black? Is that biological, or is it social? Is it diet and lifestyle, or is it my genes that I inherited from my mom? And so that's why we, we're moving away from race, because it's not necessarily a good proxy. It's a crude proxy for those. If you want to understand the biology, then measure the, the biology, measure the genes. And we call that genetic ancestry. I'll talk about that in a second. And then we're also getting better at identifying environmental risk factors, diet, lifestyle, SES, and different exposures. Because Complex disease is due to both of those and the interaction. And so the only way to really, with high resolution um, uh, and, and, and to be sophisticated in your analysis, you should study those um, independently and, and then look for interactions together. And I'll show you some examples of that. So given the current attention on disparities, we actually can use ancestry to deconstruct race in most study designs. Now this was something that initially when we started working on this, it was a lot of pushback. I was at Howard, and, and I used to go to meetings and talk about this, and the, epi and the epidemiologists used to laugh at me. It was almost like I was like the, the comedy show, you know? They would throw, they wouldn't throw anything, but it was, I felt like they was throwing apples and bananas at me and oranges, because they did not want to hear this. This was more work, and they felt that they had this under control. They felt that all you have to do is ask people what they are, and that should be sufficient. But from my studies in African Americans, I knew that in order to really delve into the issue of genetics and risk, we had to um, better quantify the genetic background. So one of the things we found is that communities of color are highly admixed. And ancestry can help uncover the genetic structure at the individual and the population level. So this is just a, a schematic showing the model. African Americans and Hispanics have a mixture of chromosomes of genes from different populations. And when you look at their overall genetics, their genome, we can find a mosaic of situations where if we look at those chromosomes, we'll find blocks of European ancestry and blocks of African ancestry. It's like a mosaic. It's really neat. And that could help us understand the genetic background for risk, for disease. The markers we look at are called ancestry informative markers. These are polymorphisms, those SNPs that I was mentioning earlier that allow us to differentiate West African versus European versus Native American ancestry. There's thousands of them throughout the genome, thousands of them. And so we've quantified, we've published on all of these different markers across the genome, and we use them to estimate individual ancestry. Now, what is this? This is what we call a structure plot. Along the x-axis are individuals, the y-axis is a proportion of ancestry. So there's three populations, West Africans from Cameroon, whites from Baltimore, Maryland, and blacks from D.C. You'll notice that, for the most part, the, the Bamiliki from Cameroon, um, homogeneous in terms of West African background in red. The whites from Baltimore are green. Now, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then the African Americans from D.C. These are self-reported African Americans. Some of them have, you see the red there, significant West African ancestry, over 90%. But then there are some individuals that have significant European ancestry, almost 90%. And we see that 
This is self-report. These are folks who identify as black, maybe because of the one drop rule or whatever, but they have significant European ancestry or Native American ancestry. Now, some of you are wondering, what's going on in the middle there with those whites from Baltimore? I, I did this study when I was at Howard University. And at Howard University Hospital, for some reason, I couldn't recruit whites. <laughs> um, so I called my buddies up at Hopkins. I had a joint appointment at Hopkins, so I called my buddies up. And I said, can you send over some DNA from white folk? I'm doing this study. They said, sure, Rick. They sent over two trays of DNA, about over um, 180 or so DNA samples. And we typed these markers. And then I looked at, at, the, at the proportion of ancestry, and about 12 of them have significant African ancestry, right? Eight or 12 or so. That's the red lines there. And so I called them back. I said, I thought you were sending over all white. They said, they are all white. I said, well, you know, th there's, there's some people here that have significant European ancestry. Can you, can you check? They said, all right, we'll check. We'll get back to you. So the next day I get a call, right? They call me and they say, um, well, Rick, you know, uh, uh, we, we went back to the records when the, the coordinator recruited them for the study, and we found that uh, we did have uh, a couple of African Americans, about 12 of them, on that tray of DNA that we sent you. Uh, we didn't realize that we forgot about it. Thanks for telling us. Peace, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't messed up. Actually, what it did was it, it made me feel good because it allowed us, this, I knew that we were going somewhere with this, with this work because it allowed us to identify that, um, that these guys had significant African ancestry. And this happens all the time in these big studies where you're recruiting from multiple sites, you have what they call misclassification of the sample, or you're just being lazy and you say, okay, they just looked white, you know. And you know, I have an aunt that looks white. She's not white, you know. So, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> this is when I started feeling really good that we can actually utilize this uh, in our research. And so I started doing that. I started everything I published, everything I, I wrote in terms of grants, I would, I would stress the importance of this. And as I said, there was a lot of pushback. Right? A lot of pushback. So this is another way of showing that data that I showed earlier, uh, the two-dimensional plot. This is a, a, um, a triangular plot of, this is West African, Native American, and then 100% European in that corner. If you look at that red square, there's no dividing line between who's black and who's white, okay? And Halle Berry, my girl, is in there. <laughs> and nobody's gonna say she's not black, okay? It's about how you were socialized. So for some of those some of those black dots have more European than some of the Europeans. But guess what? When we look at Hispanics, we see even more variation. I think they're even more heterogeneous than African Americans because of the, the proportion of, Af of uh, Native American ancestry. So if you look at these Puerto Rican and uh, uh, Mexican um, um, structure plots, what we find is the Puerto Rican population has a significantly more African ancestry. And that's similar to what I was saying earlier. Right? And so um, we shouldn't pull them all together uh, because not only have they different genetic backgrounds, but they also have different uh, diet and lifestyles. And so um, uh, that's something that emerged also within the last couple of years where there's been particular focus paid attention to where samples are coming from and their genetic background. And so anyway, I tell my students all the time, uh, the green here is, is the reason why, um, where is it? Where is it? Oh, here it is. The green here is why uh, J-Lo has what she has, <laughs> because of that. <laughs> now, the great thing about these markers is that we can, we can look at them across these chromosomes and estimate ancestry across these chromosomes, and then leverage that information to find or map genes for disease. It's called admixture mapping. And so we did this study back in 20, 2004 where we looked at a region on chromosome 5 and typed these markers in Africans, Europeans, and African Americans. And you'll notice that the whites, the Africans and the whites, pretty homogeneous there in terms of their chromosomes, red, all blue. But we look at the African Americans, the same chromosome, same markers. It was a mosaic. Some African Americans had big chunks of European ancestry. Some have small chunks. And so this is the, the, the cool, fascinating part because we can actually uh, 
look for where these risk genes are coming from and, and look at where, which population they're coming from. So anyway, this is my chromosome plot. This is my plot. I used a company called 23andMe to map my uh, chromosomes in terms of ancestry. Now this is important to understand. I show any African American's chromosomes like this, it will be a mosaic for the most part, unless you came straight from Nigeria or Ghana or something. But even there, you'd probably still have some European ancestry, especially along the coast of those regions. <laughs> but uh, you notice that some of my chromosomes have uh, big chunks of European ancestry. And I have, on average, about 8% Native American ancestry. Now, this is important. I have to say this. Uh, is the camera on? <laughs> because my mother, <laughs> my mother always said that she had Native American ancestry. And I would say, why do you believe this? Why do you keep saying this? She said, because she had good hair. <laughs> that was her justification. She had good hair. And so uh, I, that's when I realized that a lot of times we claim Native American ancestry because we don't want to claim anything else. But that hair could have came from Europeans too, right? Anyway, 8%. That is real. So she was right. She was right. I don't know about the good hair, but she was right about the Native American. On average, 12% European. But look at all those different chromosomes. Look at chromosome 15. Chromosome 15 is all African, 100% African, 100% Mandingo. <laughs> all, almost all of my chromosomes are mixed up, right, with, with chunks of, of other ancestries. But 15 is all African. So what genes are on chromosome 15? Guess? Anybody want to guess? Skin color. That's why he's so black. <laughs> <laughs> I have African alleles for the, 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 the two major predictors of skin color. I have strong African alleles. I don't have any European ancestry on that chromosome. And so just for skin color, I, I'm using this skin color as an example, but let's say if that was a risk gene for prostate cancer, right? And we knew sort of which um, ancestry it was coming from, we can leverage the the, um, the um, chromosome uh, chunks, the ancestry along those chromosomes to understand your risk. And that's where things are going now. So also, the pattern of admixture varies geographically and socially. <coughs> Running around the country for the last 15 years, different African American communities, one of the things we find is <laughs> it varies, the proportion of European ancestry. Look at the, um, look at the the coast of South Carolina. The lowest amount of European ancestry among the Gullah people, the Gullah Sea Islands in South Carolina. You guys heard of the Gullah? Geechee? 3.5%. Those people are direct descendants of enslaved Africans that have been on those islands since slavery. There hasn't been a lot of gene flow. People are leave, but they're not, you know, so those are direct descendants of enslaved Africans. The highest proportion is out west in Seattle, Washington. Remember I was telling you about the Pacific Northwest? 35% on average, European ancestry. So what that means is three to four out of every 10 black people we tested had one white parent. That's what that means. Almost four out of every 10 that we tested had one white parent. And so that's why when you think about what Tiger Woods was saying and all of that, I mean, it, you know, there's a lot more mixing going on out west. And that's why, I think I mentioned this earlier at lunch to some of you, that's why my blood pressure goes down when I'm out in Seattle. <laughs> they treat black folk differently. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if we were to look at the, the, the southern states versus the northern states, we'll find that there is significant difference in the proportion of European ancestry. In the South, it's a lot less than it is proportionally in the North. The, ur the uh, urban cosmopolitan uh, cities like Chicago, DC, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Pittsburgh, higher proportions of European ancestry. In the South, it's on you know, 10%, Atlanta, 12% in um, uh, 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 mid-Louisiana. But the only problem is, is New Orleans, 22, almost 23% in New Orleans. I remember what I said about the history. That's what I meant. About we, can't, we can't just think of African Americans as just one group. 
right? I mean, there's different local histories and local experiences. And so the French are the reason why we see the 22.5% in New Orleans. That 18.5 is in Oklahoma City, in the middle. Uh, Sac Sacramento, 22% in California, and LA, 26%. Very high levels. Um, and then 35%. So 10 times less we see in uh, South uh, Carolina. But even South Carolina has its own sort of local experience. So we have 3.5% among the Gullah, about 10% in Charleston on the coast, and then as we go to central South Carolina, Columbia, the capital, it's about 18%. Now that's all low country. That's, they call it low country. So we go from 3.5 to 18% European ancestry among African Americans. Now some are saying, well, why is that? I'll tell you why. <laughs> the, <laughs> Columbia is the state capital. There's a major highway that runs through there, you know, major university, uh, University of South Carolina. But also, there was a person named Strom Thurmond <laughs> who, who contributed a lot of 18% <laughs> himself. <laughs> Remember what I said about these local histories. I guess you guys don't know who Strom Thurmond is. Huh? That's one of those, uh, OK, y'all don't like to talk about that. <laughs> All right. So recently, that, so this was my data I showed you here. But recently, there was a big study out of 23andMe they published, which actually shows the same exact pattern that I've been showing over the last 10, 15 years. With their data set of African Americans, they show this regional sort of effect of ancestry across the United States. But what's more important is we can talk about the biology all we want, but insurance status is the major predictor for health. And so who remains still today with, uh, um, with the Affordable Health Care Act? Who still remains uninsured? It's in areas in the southeast where we see black folk, uh, and in areas in Texas where we see Hispanics. It's an enormous amount of people who are still uninsured. Skin color also is uh, interesting. When I, we look at skin color in SES, uh, we look throughout uh, South America and Central America, we see um, lighter skinned individuals making more and having more education than darker skinned individuals. So we talk about disparities, many influencing factors, gene, gene, gene environment interaction, discrimination, perceived racism, stress, life course selection, cultural factors, uh, behavior, SES, and in institutional arrangement. Now this was uh, a figure that I, I, I changed up some from uh, Kamara Jones. She's an um, um, a, a epidemiologist um, uh, at uh, CDC. And so she created this theory about racism and health. And um, um, I, I added more information to that because I wanted to include the, the biology of it. But earlier today, I was talking about um, perceived discrimination and health. Um, the Journal of Black Psychology back in 2009 showed that, that uh, there were correlations among perceived discrimination, health, chronic disease, reactions to uh, medicine, and adherence to physician recommendations. One of the things they showed is that for many um, um, uh, measures of health, if an individual felt uh, or, or there was this perceived discrimination, there was a negative correlation from general health pretest, four weeks, 16 weeks, the number of chronic diseases was the only thing that was positively correlated with discrimination. Patient satisfaction, this team perception of working with your doctor. So what they did was these guys went into Michigan, uh, into a clinic, and uh, the patients were black and the physicians were white and asked them these questions and, uh, and, and also did this uh, survey of discrimination and found that perceived discrimination had an influence on overall health. So when we think about um, uh, biology and its effects on health, <laughs> we also have to think about um, the social condition, the social cultural influencing factors that are important also. So real quick, real quick, prostate cancer. One of the, uh, the most diagnosed cancers among men. Um, we have this disparity where it's much higher in incidence among African Americans than whites and Asians. We uh, look at populations of African descent and we see also a high incidence in uh, the Caribbean and in Nigeria, very, very high in Cameroon. This is probably one of the best studies in West Africa. A colleague of mine, Fru Nguafu, 
uh, found evidence of that uh, the incidence to be about 195 per 100,000 men, which is up there with African Americans. And he actually was looking at a rural population um, and where they found significant prostate cancer in high-grade PEN, which is a precursor lesion. We've done a lot of genetic studies to try and understand what is contributing to uh, risk for prostate cancer. And out of all the disparities, this one disease is, is one in which there is a strong genetic component that's influencing or accounting for the disparity. Most disparities, be it hypertension, diabetes, end-stage renal, not end-stage, um, uh, diabetes and um, asthma, most of those are, are social cultural, the, the, um, what accounts for the disparity. But prostate cancer, very strong genetic component that accounts for that disparity. One of the big uh, risk loci is on chromosome 8. In fact, when we look at the risk allele frequencies in the populations of West Africans, Europeans, I mean, West Africans, African Americans, Europeans, and Asians, we find that they're much more common in West African descent populations. These are um, um, replicated, um, and there's a, there's a consensus on these uh, polymorphisms contributing to risk for prostate cancer. So this is not some single study. This is studies of the last 10 years that have consistently shown that these four um, uh, loci or, or markers increase risk for prostate cancer. But look at the frequency in West Africa. Look at the frequency in African Americans, and then look at the frequency in Asians and Europeans. So we, we see that these polymorphisms, the frequency alone and the effect sizes could impact or, or could account for that disparity that we see. And I'm going to show you evidence in that in a second. So one of the things we did was we looked at these risk alleles across different human populations. These are just regular people and found that looking at these risk alleles, we can actually um, separate out West African populations from other world populations. And that also um, uh, is suggestive of, of, uh, of some form of um, uh, selection or something that was operating that is um, uh, one of the reasons why we see these risk alleles being so common in West Africa. One of the things we found in our, in our cohorts of African Americans is that when we quantify West African ancestry and break it into quartiles, West Africans that have a higher proportion of West African, I mean African Americans that have a higher proportion of West African ancestry, be that greater than 84%, they have a higher risk for prostate cancer, about 1.8-fold increased risk for prostate cancer compared to men in the first quartile. So what that means is if you're somebody like me who has high levels of African ancestry, I have about 80, I think it was 88 or something, 82, 84% or something, compared to other African Americans um, uh, with lower I would be at a higher risk because of that shared um, West African genetic ancestry. And that would be suggestive of some risk alleles that are common in West Africa. When we looked at um, um, men that had um, from zero to seven of these prostate cancer risk alleles, we found that with increasing dosage of risk alleles, so does your increased risk for prostate cancer. And in fact, it goes up to six-fold increased risk for high-risk prostate cancer. One of the things that's fascinating, though, is as these risk alleles increase, so does African ancestry. So it's a, it's a situation where these risk alleles are associated with African ancestry. Individuals that have more of those risk alleles have higher amounts of West African ancestry. And this is just another way of showing what I just said, this, this um, risk allele dosage and West African ancestry being correlated. But if West African ancestry is um, increases your risk, maybe Native American ancestry decreases. And so we said, well, why don't we look and see in our blacks and whites if, in fact, Native American ancestry decreases risk for prostate cancer. And in fact, it does. We found among African Americans with a had greater than 8% Native American ancestry, there was a protective effect. Whites that had greater than 90% had a protective effect, and it was quite significant. This was, this was, this was really uh, exciting and important we just found this uh, recently. Um, what this suggests is that there are these protective effects in some populations against prostate cancer, which is why the incidence is so low among Asian and Native American populations. Prostate cancer um, is just really one of the cancers that um, is associated with ancestry. We looked at other cancers, and we didn't find um, any associations with ancestry. In fact, head and neck cancer. Um, the risk 
um, uh, the, I mean, the, the disparity isn't accounted for by genetics. In fact, it's more um, SES and income, uh, income and, and insurance status. The same thing with colorectal cancer. So we didn't see a similar sort of effect that we saw with ancestry and prostate cancer. So I'm going to end with this. This is um, a study looking at smoking cessation. I know that there's a lot of you guys out in the audience that do that study uh, smoking, um, t tobacco, nicotine studies, and, and smoking cessation. Smoking cessation is the process of stopping to smoke, I think. <laughs> I, some people may not know. I don't know. So, so I actually was able, when I was in Chicago, to get my hands on a, uh, a clinical trial uh, samples and data from a clinical trial that was done in Chicago where they studied smoking cessation among blacks and whites. You, and they, they were studying a, um, it was a clinical trial for a drug called naltrexone. Now, naltrexone is one of those old drugs that people have used for a while for um, um, alcohol abuse or dependency. It actually appears to work on some of the um, new opioid receptors, um, supposedly. And, uh, but one of the things that has been found is that there's different effects across different populations. So we said, okay, well, let's look at um, uh, and see if genetic ancestry is, this, is an effect modifier uh, for in, in smoking cessation among African Americans. So what this um, initial study showed was that if you look at um, whites and blacks who were given the drug and uh, placebo, because this is a two-arm trial, Individuals who were, who were white and they were given the drug, um, this is the time to relapse. Uh, there was a separation uh, on the time to relapse. And so individuals who had the drug actually did not relapse as high as those who uh, were given the placebo. But for African Americans, there was no effect there. There was no difference between the drug and the placebo. You guys get what I'm saying? Placebo is just water. <laughs> the two-arm trial. So then we said, all right, well, let's look at the um, African-American samples only to see if there is this um, uh, um, interaction based on ancestry. So what we did was we typed ancestry informative markers, estimated ancestry among those African-Americans. And uh, we stratified the group based on high West African ancestry and low West African ancestry. Uh, and, and you look here, you could see the, uh, the demographics are the same across both of those groups. So there is no sort of... Um, social demographic difference there between high and West African genetic ancestry African Americans for this particular study. What we found was that, um, and this is just another way of showing what I showed earlier, is that the naltrexone effect is effective in whites but not blacks, okay? Um, this is a four week quit rate, I mean quit and uh, um, 12 week quit, quit outcomes. And uh, you find that for whites, the, you see this treatment effect, but no significant treatment effect in, um, across those quit um, periods for African Americans. We, as I said, type these ancestry informative markers. So this is the spread of ancestry in the blacks versus whites. And uh, this shows the four week quit rates in African Americans um, between the naltrexone and the placebo groups. The naltrexone square, square uh, column is dark and the lighter column is the placebo. You'll notice that for the whole African-American sample, there is no difference there. The P is insignificant. But if you look at those African-Americans that had low West African ancestry, we see an effect, right? We see a significant four-week quit rate uh, difference between uh, um, those individuals that had the naltrexone versus the placebo. And then those with high West African ancestry, we don't see an effect there. Now, this is big. This is important because what this is saying is that genetic ancestry is, a, is, a, is modifying the effect of naltrexone in terms of smoking cessation in the African Americans. And so in African Americans that had higher European ancestry are going to respond better to that drug than those that have higher African ancestry. And that's why we see an effect in whites. We showed this interaction. Um, uh, this model, first model, just shows that uh, for naltrexone and then high West African ancestry, there's no effect there. But when we show them together, this interaction, uh, it is quite significant. And so there's a, 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 a pretty solid risk difference there um, uh, in that second model. And um, 
uh, we adjusted for age and, and gender and BMI and other, other variables there, uh, social uh, demographic variables. This is another way of showing that. Um, when we vary the treatment effect based on high and low ancestry, we see that the uh, low West African ancestry group were the ones that responded the most. So what, what does that mean? That means that, that there could be some genes that are common among West Africans that are influencing the effect of naltrexone. And so that's sort of the next step uh, from this is to, is first we've shown that there is this ancestry effect. Now we can go in and find the genetic difference there that's impacting uh, that treatment effect. And, and I, think, I think folks have seen that in the past with alcohol uh, treatment, uh, using naltrexone for alcohol abuse. Uh, but nobody's really tried to focus in on why this is, this is occurring. So in conclusion, they, the high incidence of uh, and aggressive features of prostate cancer in African Americans are likely linked to, to genetic factors associated with West African ancestry. And so as I mentioned earlier, among African American men that have greater than 84% West African ancestry, the risk increases 1.8 fold. Now, I didn't tell you this earlier, but if we compare just white, self-reported whites and self-reported blacks and look at the incidence, the, the relative risk difference is 1.8. So this is very similar and when we stratify based on African ancestry. So when we use genetic ancestry analysis, we can actually deconstruct some of the risk factors for disparities into genetic and non-genetic components. So some of the recommendations that I, that I like to, to say when I speak is that you know, we need to prioritize which disparities have, have strong genetic effects. Not all of them have strong genetic effects, but we're dumping a lot of money on, on all of them, thinking that we can sequence genes and determine what is contributing to the disparity. I think we need to study the etiology, the effects on the environment, and then develop interventions um, and be honest about the fact that there's, uh, that biology is not accounting for that difference. It's more behavioral and uh, SES. I think we should increase transdisciplinary research, which is why I hang out with people like Mignon, because uh, she doesn't understand genes. <laughs> and I don't understand uh, the, the social stuff, so. <laughs> I think as, as, a, as, as, as um, geneticists, we need to engage uh, social scientists more to gain a better appreciation of the non-genetic and, and uh, even the genetic variables that should be explored. So anyway, I just want to thank uh, the folks from my group and other groups that I've interacted with over the past and my funding um, uh, sources. Thank you very much.